All right, there we go. So we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for coming. I know uh, this is a, a late session, especially since there's uh, pub crawls and other things uh, going on. So I uh, do appreciate uh, you taking the time out. Today we're gonna be talking about deep learning for developers. Uh, just a quick note, uh, I am actually not uh, Hage Lupesco. He's a colleague of mine uh, at AWS. Uh, my name's Nate Slater. Uh, this is a repeat session, so Hage was the uh, original presenter, so I'm presenting off his, his deck. Uh, I forgot to update it with my name. So, uh, And then we have uh, Sunjay uh, Min, uh, who will be uh, presenting the second part of the presentation uh, from Samsung, talking about how they've used uh, uh, some convolutional and recurrent neural networks to do some very interesting things uh, with uh, heart rate monitoring. Okay. So uh, these are the, the main topics I'm going to cover. Uh, first is just sort of an overview of deep learning uh, and why uh, it's important, why it's a big deal. Uh, then we'll talk about some of the basic concepts. Just a show of hands, how many folks here have actually like, written uh, you know, a neural net in Python or, or one of the frameworks, TensorFlow or whatnot? OK, a decent amount. So, so we're actually going to j dive into some of the actual uh, code and some of the uh, model architectures that, that you see uh, when you're uh, writing these types of learning algorithms. Uh, and then uh, you know, we'll, we'll go into some, some of the details about how you actually code a deep neural net. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned, we will have Samsung uh, talk about uh, their use of this technology. And the goal is, uh, by the end of the session, to really understand what deep learning is and how you can get started with it today. So uh, as we go through this, you know, I, think, I think one thing to keep in mind is uh, you don't have to understand all of the details of you know, what, what the neural net is doing under the hood to get started. Right? At some point, you'll probably want to learn the details, but if you're a software engineer and you're interested in learning about how you can incorporate learning algorithms into your code, uh, by the end of the session, you should hopefully have a pretty good idea about how to do that. Okay, so deep learning is a big deal. Uh, Andrew Ang, who's a really well-regarded sort of thought leader in, in deep learning, uh, he was one of the original founders of Google Brain. Then he went on to found Coursera. Uh, he's a professor or, or was a professor at Stanford. Uh, I've taken a number of his classes uh, on Coursera. He's just a, a really great uh, sort of uh, communicator and, and uh, just really can communicate complex uh, technical topics really, really well. Uh, and uh, he basically views deep learning as a superpower, right? You can do uh, synth synthesizing art from you know, uh, images. You can do machine translation. Uh, there's a whole number of almost magical things that you can do with machine learning. So one of the questions I get a lot uh, you know, I was just having Thanksgiving with my family and my dad, who's, you know, kind of a, a technology Luddite, was asking me, you know, what, what I do every day. And one of the things I've noticed is there, there's a sort of a, a misunderstanding of what artificial intelligence is, what machine learning is, and what, what deep learning is, right? A lot of people use the terms interchangeably. And we've even done that a little bit at AWS, where we've labeled, uh, you know, certain services as AI slash ML. Uh, and in reality, they're really more pure machine learning services. So if you, if you look at this uh, sort of Venn, Venn diagram type image on, on the slide here, uh, artificial intelligence is really a, a term that encompasses a whole set of different fields, uh, including machine learning. And artificial intelligence uh, was actually something uh, that uh, Turing uh, sort of started when he asked, uh, can machines do what, what we can? And when you talk about AI, you're really talking not only about you know, technical concepts, but also some philosophical concepts, right? Really, what is thought? What, can we teach machines to think? Um, and, and really, again, the, 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 the appropriate thing to ask is, can, can we teach machines to do what we do, right? Uh, machine learning is actually a subset of that, and it refers to a specific set of algorithms, statistics-based statistics algorithms, uh, that uh, can, quote unquote, learn. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of different types of machine learning algorithms. There's decision trees, there's logistic regression, uh, and then, of course, we have deep learning, which is just one of these machine learning-based techniques. So today, we're really gonna be focusing on the, the machine learning and the deep learning piece. And really what machine learning does is it, it, it sort of tweaks the traditional programming model. So 
for folks here who've been doing software engineering, software programming, uh, typically what you do is you, know, you have a bunch of data. Maybe you're reading data from a file, reading data from a database. Uh, and then you've got to apply some rules to that data, right? Uh, you know, maybe you're dealing with data from a form. And if certain fields in the form aren't filled out, uh, you have to display an error message, right? So essentially what you're doing is you're hard coding the rules based on the data that you see. Uh, in the machine learning approach, you start with the data and then you start with some known answers. That's, that's your ground truth, right? You start with something that you already know the answer to and then you derive the rules from that. So it really changes the way you actually uh, develop software because you can get out of the business of having to write very rigid, brittle, rules-based code. Uh, and instead, you can use these learning algorithms that will actually be able to do the right thing with data that they've never seen before. So deep learning is a big deal uh, because it has a growing impact on our lives. And if we take a look at just some of the services we consume every day, uh, we have all these personalization services, and I think this is a, probably a screenshot from like Amazon Prime Video, where you know, if you watch one type of show, we'll recommend a whole bunch of other shows, right? So we can look at your past uh, history and compute a set of recommendations for you. And if, again, going back to the, the rules versus the learning approach, you could think, well, if I was to do this in the traditional model, you know, the number of rules I would need over time to account for everybody's tastes and everybody's sort of uh, past uh, video history that they watch, you just couldn't code that, right? There's no way to actually to, to write an algorithm, a traditional algorithm, where you hard code those rules. So you have to use machine learning for those types of problems. Uh, in our fulfillment centers, we're using it for logistics, right? So that's uh, those orange things there are the Kiva robots, which zip around the fulfillment centers and uh, pull items off, off the, the shelf. So we, we use uh, machine learning extensively to, to orchestrate the logistics in the fulfillment centers. Uh, everybody knows uh, Amazon Alexa, right? So there is a whole bunch of, uh, you know, automatic speech recognition, right? When you speak to the device, we have to go from spoken text uh, there's speech to text, and then from that text, we do some natural language processing. Uh, and then from that, we can then you know, figure out what it is you ask the device to do. Uh, and then, of course, autonomous vehicles are, are you know, a, a really uh, kind of uh, important and uh, uh, part, part, of, part of machine learning, right? You've got uh, many different companies who, who want to get into this space, uh, and it makes heavy, heavy use of computer vision uh, for autonomous driving. I think in this case, we're actually showing a drone. So you, you know, autonomous vehicles is more than just cars. It can also be uh, drones and, and other unmanned uh, vehicles. So another thing, uh, particularly in the area of image classification, uh, you know, machines can actually do better than humans now, right? So here we have a picture of a cat. You can see we've uh, basically you know, got a set of classifications uh, there with probabilities uh, attached to them. You can see that uh, you know, the, the computer is correctly identifying that this is a tabby cat with a 57.3% uh, probability of it being accurate. You know, clearly, it's not a toilet seat with 1.66% with uh, accuracy. Uh, and this, this is a little bit hard to read because it's kind of uh, on its side, but you'll see the one to pay attention to is that, that circle with the line through it. That, that's humans, right? So you can see the uh, uh, AlexNet and uh, Google Lynette and VGG16, those are image classification implementations. Those are doing significantly better than humans. Uh, so in, in the uh, case of computer vision and image classification, it's really a, sol it's a solved problem, right? You know, the computer can do it, and they can do it better, better than the human can. Okay, uh, so let's take a look uh, you know, at some deep learning in action. Uh, NVIDIA, uh, maker of graphics cards that have uh, accelerators on them that are really, really important for some of the linear algebra that uh, underpins the uh, deep learning, uh, is, is uh, basically uh, building a platform for uh, self-driving cars. I think we have a video here. So you can see, uh, you know, we've got some uh, bounding box, uh, an, a computer vision algorithm that's, that's able to identify the other cars on the road, draw a box around it. I think there's some audio, but it's a little hard to, a little hard to hear. You know, so part of when, when you have a self-driving car is just knowing what else is on the road. Uh, you also have to be able to identify the lanes, right? You don't want the car to 
to drift out of, out of its lane. Uh, this, I believe, is, is LIDAR, right? So this is actually a, a, a different type of imagery uh, that, that you use, which I think uh, is better at telling uh, like spatial uh, like distances, right? Car stops, fortunately, as the pedestrians are crossing. <laughs> and so, yeah, it continues on. Uh, so, so one of the things that that's uh, really interesting about autonomous vehicles is it's, it's using several different types of signals, right? So classic computer vision, you know, you feed it an image, it can tell if it's a cat or not a cat. When you're dealing with self-driving cars, you have to be uh, able to create a model that has uh, sources of, of data from, from lots of different uh, cameras, cameras at different angles, uh, LIDAR uh, data. Uh, so you're building a very complex model that has, you know, able to consume rich amounts uh, of data. So this is basically what, what a self-driving car sees. And I think that's it. Okay, so uh, let's dig into uh, what it takes to get started with this, right? Uh, obviously a self-driving car, pretty complicated. Uh, but the good news is, is that to get started, you don't have to uh, go to the, the same lengths that you would if you were going to be building a self-driving car. Uh, and everything that we're going to talk about here uh, is what essentially, it's the foundation for what these more complex problems are actually uh, doing. So uh, a neural net, uh, a neural net is essentially trying to mimic what, what happens in the brain. And th there is some debate about whether or not what a neural net is actually doing is sort of biologically correct. Uh, but for the purpose of this discussion, uh, you know, brains consist of something called neurons. And we have a whole lot of them. We have even more synapses which connect those neurons. Uh, and if you look at a, a simple neural net, uh, what, what it's trying to do is it's organized in the same, in the same way as the, the neurons in the brain, right? So we have uh, those circles there. Those are, those are considered the neurons. Uh, we have some data that's coming in, that's the, you know, X1 through Xn. Uh, then we apply some function uh, to that uh, data, uh, and we end up with a prediction, right? We end up with, with an answer of some sort, right? So again, uh, there is some debate around whether or not uh, the brain is actually functioning or a neural net is actually doing the exact same thing in, 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 as the brain is, uh, but that's sort of not important, right? The, the, the important thing is the, the neural net is really more a terminology uh, that sort of defines uh, the structure of the model. And, you know, mathematically, uh, this is what it looks like, right? You're essentially uh, taking a sum uh, across a vector of numbers, uh, and you're applying a uh, coefficient, that's the W, uh, term uh, to the data, which is the x term, uh, and then that outer uh, term is some kind of nonlinear function. We'll talk about those, those in a second. Uh, in the case of a neural net, we call that an activation function. So essentially, you have a neuron, and the neuron applies some kind of activation function, uh, and then you end up with some value, and the value is your prediction. Uh, that's the y value there. And uh, these neural nets consist of layers. So uh, you have your input layer, which is basically the data you're feeding into the neural net, uh, and then you'll have some number of layers uh, be beyond that, and those are called uh, uh, hidden layers. And if every neuron in each layer connects to every other neuron in the next layer, it's called a fully connected layer. So you'll see a lot of these types of graphs when you start working with neural nets, where you have all these lines uh, that are connecting these, uh, these layers together. And, uh, you know, neural nets can be very simple, where you only have several layers, right? Uh, or they can be very complex, where you have multiple layers. And in fact, the term uh, deep neural net typically refers to a neural net where you have many, many layers, right? So this is, yeah, just what I mentioned before. Um, uh, a fully connected layer is when all of the neurons uh, are connected to the previous layer uh, and to the next layer. 
And if you were to think of this as a graph, uh, the edges, so the lines uh, that are connecting uh, these neurons to one another, um, basically have weights associated with them. These are, these are coefficients. Uh, and that's what the model is learning during training. And uh, I guess, show of hands, uh, how many folks here have worked with, with just straight linear regression, like multi, multivariate linear regression, right? So um, if you're dealing with a small number of variables in linear regression, you can actually solve for the coefficients directly. You can, you can use calculus to do it, but if you have a large number of them, it becomes too cumbersome. So uh, even in a, in a simple linear regression, you can actually learn the coefficients, right, using the same exact technique that you, you, learn, you use with a neural net. Uh, we'll talk about uh, what that technique is, but it's basically a way of uh, looking at your error. You know, you make a prediction, you see how far away the prediction is from the ground truth, and then you adjust the, the coefficients accordingly to try and minimize the error. That's essentially what's going on here, right? So all of those weights uh, between each uh, uh, neuron uh, in one layer and the next layer, uh, the, the weights are learned uh, during the training process. Okay, so there's some specific types of neural nets uh, that, that do some similar actions, but uh, they're designed for sort of more specific purposes. Uh, in this case, uh, if we're talking about a convolutional neural net, what we're doing here is, uh, instead, of, instead of just having a fully connected, uh, a set of fully connected layers, we have some uh, convolutional layers, right? Uh, so we're sort of changing the, the concept slightly in that we're going to apply uh, a filter, and the filter has the weights uh, in it, uh, and those weights basically are sort of uh, slid across uh, the input image, and uh, you multiply the weight by each of the pixel values, uh, and you end up with a set of new values, right? And so th those are called filters. And in a convolutional neural net, what you're actually learning are the filters, right? So the first filter you may learn might find edges. Uh, the next filter might find, uh, you know, circular uh, curve, curve shapes. And you can stack these filters up one on top of one another and actually end up with a very, very specific uh, sort of filter, like a you know, combined filter, aggregate filter. And so when you're training a neural net, a convolutional neural net, say, with, with image recognition, image classification, essentially what you're learning are, are these filters. But the, the concept's the same, right? The filter is basically just a collection of weights that you're applying to the input neurons. And this is, this is sort of what the computer is seeing, right? So it, it doesn't look very meaningful to the human eye, but you can start to see it's, it's pulling out a set of, of patterns in, in the data. Uh, and remember, you know, the computer doesn't see an image, it just sees an array of numbers, right? If you have a 400 by 400 image, 400 by 400 grayscale image, that's a 1600 length vector of numbers, right? That's all the computer is seeing. And uh, the, these are really, really common in visual uh, computer vision, right? The convolutional neural nets are, are very, very good uh, for these types of operations. And, and this is a really cool uh, 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 slide. You'll, you'll see this. Uh, this was from a, a, a rather famous paper that came out that explored what each layer was actually sort of seeing in the convolutional layers. And you can see in the beginning, it's, it looks like it's finding, you know, mostly some edges, maybe some colors, and then in the second layer, it's finding curves. And then you get into the deep layer, and it's actually, you know, I, you know you're stacking all these filters up, and it's actually identifying dogs, right? So uh, you can get very, very rich detail uh, from these filters. Okay, so there are other types of neural nets. Uh, in some cases, uh, you know, what, what you're trying to do is actually make a prediction based on something you've seen before, right? Uh, and in this case, you would use something like a recurrent neural net. So if you had time series data, for example, and you wanted to say, hey, based on, you know, past patterns uh, in, in my data from, from, you know, T minus, you know, N uh, seconds, uh, what's, you know, T plus one gonna be? Uh, so these would use a, a recurrent neural net. These, these are, are pretty tricky, uh, I'll be honest. Uh, you know, for folks that are new to neural nets, I'd say start, start first by learning uh, fully connected neural nets and then go to CNNs and then go to RNNs <laughs> uh, because uh, these can get, get uh, a little bit tricky. But, but the concept is, is ultimately uh, the same. It, just the difference is, is that you, they're recurrent, right? So you're, you're going to basically uh, pass in a value X uh, you'll call your activation function on it, you'll get a value y, 
and then you're going to pass y back in to the next, uh, to the next uh, layer. And uh, because you're passing what you had predicted previously back into the next layer, you're essentially remembering what had, what had been predicted in the past. And if we unroll this, uh, you'll see that this is what it looks like, right? So we start with our, our input layer, and we have you know, x. Uh, we pass that in. We get some prediction y. Uh, and then, you know, we, we pass that on to the next, uh, I guess we're unrolling, we're unrolling that, uh, that, that uh, recurrent neural net on the left. So you have x0, you get, you know, prediction h0. You'll notice h0 gets fed back into the next, uh, the next layer of the neural net. And, and what is that doing, right? So if you think about this in terms of, of um, say, something like machine translation, uh, you can imagine, well, if I just predicted a verb in the previous layer, I probably don't predict another verb in, in this layer, right? So it can solve those, those kinds of problems. That, that's an oversimplistic example. That's essentially what, what it's doing. Uh, and this is a simple recurrent neural net. Uh, there is a uh, much more powerful kind called long short-term memory, LSTM, uh, which essentially uses four different neural nets kind of simultaneously uh, to m remember things, forget things, ignore things, uh, and pay attention to things. <laughs> Uh, and that's why I'm saying it gets a little complicated when you're first learning because you, you have to learn not one but, but four. Uh, but but under, the underlying concepts are the same with, with all neural nets. Okay, so uh, multiple layers combined together form a neural network, right? So whether you're dealing with an RNN or a CNN or just a fully connected neural net, uh, basically that's what it, what it comes down to. And in this case, we have essentially a uh, we have an input layer, we have two hidden layers, and we have an output layer. So this would be a, a two-layered uh, neural net. And it, again, if you think back to just sort of uh, linear logistic regression, you can actually express uh, a logistic regression as, as a simple one-layer neural net, right? It's the input layer with a bunch of activation functions and then the output layer, right? So you can basically do, do a logistic regression as a neural net. And so by adding these additional layers, you're essentially just adding more degrees of freedom uh, to the model, right? So you're, you're essentially uh, creating a very, very complex nonlinear function by doing this. Uh, so it's nonlinear, right? So, so when you're fitting this function to your data, you can, you can create a, a very, very complex function. Uh, and in the case of convolutional neural nets, you can learn features hierarchically, right, by applying multiple filters. Scalable architecture, okay, so this, this is interesting. Uh, you know, one of the things that you can do uh, with neural nets, you can, you can scale both vertically and, and horizontally, right? Be because the operations that you're performing are basically a bunch of linear algebra, so it's multiply and add, essentially. Um, those can run really, really fast uh, and in parallel on GPUs. Uh, and then when you start to get into uh, the optimization, uh, if you're doing something like gradient descent, which we'll talk about, uh, there are ways you can parallelize that actually across uh, host. So you can actually, uh, you know, run parts of it in parallel on multiple, multiple hosts. Um, so, you know, what this allows you to do is basically um, deal with very, very large uh, input se sets of data, right? Way more than we used to be able to, to handle. They are computationally intensive. So for training, uh, you absolutely are going to need to use uh, some kind of uh, accelerator like a GPU. Uh, and uh, as we'll see in the next part of the, 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 the session, uh, there's actually quite a bit of optimization that you'll want to do to do inferences. So even after you have a trained model, um, you want to make sure you can do inferences in a cost-effective way. Uh, so you can do uh, some additional optimizations on the model to make sure that it can run uh, in a scalable and, and cost-effective way. So it, do, it doesn't do you a lot of good to create a, a really nice model, only to, to realize, hey, I can't run this because I'm going to go bankrupt uh, with the uh, you know, GPU instances that I need to, to do this. Okay, so when you train a neural wet, uh, net, the first thing you do is, is called a forward pass. So essentially, you take some input data, you initialize your, your neural net and all the weights in, in, in a random way, uh, and then you get some output. Uh, and then you compare the output to the known value, to the ground truth. Uh, and then once you know how far off you are, that's your loss, you essentially do something called backpropagation, which 
you, you go backwards through the neural net and you adjust all the, the weights to try and minimize the loss. And you do this uh, a number of different times, right? You do this, you go over your training examples a number of different times. Uh, what was the question? Uh, it, uh, it, it's, some, it's something that the framework you're using will, will do for you typically, yeah. And we'll, we'll see some code examples in a second. Uh, you can write it yourself if you want to, but the good news is you don't have to nowadays with these higher level frameworks. And so uh, each pass through your training data is called an epoch. And so you just do this as many times as you feel like you need to uh, until you get to an acceptable level of loss. Uh, and so this is what's really interesting. It's, it's a non-deterministic operation, right? Uh, you're essentially empirically determining a, an, an acceptable level of loss. You're not actually uh, z zeroing it out, right? It'll never go to zero. You just hope that it goes to a low enough number. So let's look at some code, and I'll, I'll walk you through what, what's actually happening uh, in code. So uh, first step is to pick some kind of environment. So uh, you can pick uh, any number of frameworks. Uh, you know, you've got TensorFlow, you've got MXNet, you've got PyTorch, you've got Keras. Uh, and then you can go ahead and install it. In this case, we're, we're uh, doing a pip install for MXNet. Uh, Better yet, you can get started really, really quick by using SageMaker. So if you want to uh, just begin coding a neural net, you can bring up a, a SageMaker notebook, which will have all of these libraries pre-installed on it. So you don't have to go through the, the hassle of you know, downloading libraries, and in some cases you have to you know, compile, uh, uh, GCC compile stuff. Uh, we have notebook servers that are ready to go. Uh, that you can just get started with. And then we also have the deep learning AMI. So if you want to just launch an EC2 instance, you can just use the deep learning AMI. And all of these, these frameworks are uh, uh, packaged on the AMI. SageMaker is a managed service, yes. Yep. So uh, we're going to build, in this example, a uh, simple um, image classification. Uh, or this is a digit classification. So. Uh, it's a convolutional neural net. It looks like it's got uh, two, uh, two convolutional layers, two pooling layers, and then it's several fully connected layers. And this is a classic uh, machine learning problem. It's almost like the hello world of machine learning or deep learning, which is the MSNIST, uh, which is a handwritten uh, uh, digits from zero to, zero to, to nine. Uh, so you can almost imagine this is like a primitive optical character recognition task. So, this is all it takes to implement this uh, neural net in MXNet using the Gluon library. And I highly recommend, uh, if you're going to get started with MXNet, you, you do use something like Gluon, uh, because uh, the, the MXNet language or the MXNet syntax itself uses a declarative programming style, which is going to feel a little uh, odd to folks that are used to sort of more traditional Python programming. But with Gluon, uh, you can basically sort of write more familiar uh, feeling code. Uh, and so you can see here what we're doing is we're creating a sequential uh, neural net uh, and then we're adding um, a, uh, the, the, the layers, right? So we've got a convolutional 2D layer and then we've got a pooling layer then we have another 2D layer then we have another pooling layer then we're going to flatten them out. So all that does is basically take uh, the uh, multidimensional arrays and flatten them into a 2 by 2 array uh, and then we have some fully connected layers uh, at the end. And you can see the final layer is, a, is, a, is an output layer which is, has 10 outputs, one for each digit. Sure. So uh, channels uh, are basically um, the, uh, if you can think if you're dealing with a, a, like a red, green, and blue uh, image, you would, you would have three channels, one for each color. In this case, we're, I think we're, we're basically saying we want six, six filters, right? So we're, we're creating six, six channels uh, for the initial convolutional layer. Uh, the pooling layer, uh, what you do there is you, you take the output uh, from applying the filter and you, you, you grab the maximum uh, value, right? So you're essentially downsampling your data with the pooling layer. And uh, the strides are uh, how you're moving, uh, basically how you're, how you're moving the pooling uh, window over the data. And uh, same thing for the convolutional layer. Um, activation is the activation function. So as I mentioned earlier, you're going to use some kind of nonlinear function. In this case, we're using ReLU, which stands for Rectified Linear Unit, uh, which is uh, kind of like a sigmoid function, uh, but instead of 
uh, asymptoting at zero and one, it's uh, just going to be a max. Uh, it'll either be zero or it'll be it'll be one. It's it's just a better function to use um, because you don't have to worry about um, uh, slopes that are close to zero on on the asymptotes. Uh, and then we do that again. Uh, and then uh, we flatten everything, and then we go into our first dense layer, which has 120 neurons. Uh, the next dense layer has 84 neurons, and then the final one has 10. And again, remember, that we want 10 in the last one because we're trying to classify 0 to 9 digits, right? So that's 10 total. Uh, so this is, this, is, this is, you know, most neural nets that you code with, with gluon are going to look like this. Oh, yeah, so kernel size is the size of the filter. So it's basically we're saying a 5 by 5 filter. Um, and then the stride is how many uh, cells you're moving the filter each time, right? Okay, so that, that's, the model, that, that's the model architecture. So now let's get into the, uh, uh, the actual um, learning part of it, right? So in this case, we define a loss function. Uh, in this case, we're going to use cross-entropy loss, a very common uh, function uh, if you're doing classification. Uh, and then we basically create a trainer, uh, and uh, we tell it uh, we're going to use uh, SGD as the uh, method, the learning method, or the optimization method. That, that stands for stocha stochastic gradient descent. Uh, and then we iterate over each uh, epoch, right? Remember, epoch is the entire training data set. So we can say, let's say we want to do this five total times. Uh, we get our training examples. That's capital X. We get our... Uh, labeled uh, uh, ground truth, which is Y. Uh, and then we essentially uh, compute our predicted value. We compute our loss. Uh, and that Y hat equals net X. That's the forward propagation through the network. Uh, so what we're doing there is we're actually pushing the data through the network. We're getting a prediction. Then we compute the loss based on that prediction. Uh, and then we call loss backward, which basically does the backward uh, propagation uh, through the network. And so it's basically doing the, the uh, that's where the weights are getting updated. That's where the coefficients are actually updating. So you don't have to write any of that, that code yourself. Uh, it, it's all uh, handled for you here. The reason why you have that with statement where it says autograd uh, dot record, uh, because uh, you only want to do this during training, right? You don't need the gradients when you're doing inferences. So when you're doing inferences, you just do forward propagation, right? Because by then you have a fully trained model, and all you're doing is you just want a prediction. But when you're doing training, you need to uh, basically do this backward propagation step to learn the weights. And then we just step through it for each batch, right? Uh, so what you do is you break your training examples up into batches. And so each epoch consists of a number of batches. Uh, you run uh, each batch through the model, both forward propagation and back propagation, and ideally at the end, you'll end up with a optimized loss. You don't actually uh, see the weights here. They're stored, um, you know, they're basically stored in a tensor uh, object that's kind of hidden, hidden from you, right? So that, that's what's really nice about using these uh, these uh, higher level frameworks is you don't actually have to keep track of all those vectors of weights. You do see that net.collect params call up there. That's essentially saying, give me all the, the weights. So it, based on the structure of the neural net, it vectorizes all the weights and passes that into the trainer. But it's hidden from you completely. So you don't actually have to interact with them directly. Yeah, in, in one of those method calls, it's storing some data somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. You can get to the weights if you want them. Yes, absolutely. OK, so uh, one, one thing that's really, really common is, uh, especially in, in well-understood areas like computer vision, uh, is you don't really have to start from scratch. So there's a lot of really good models that are out there already. So you can use a pre-trained model. Uh, and you can, you know, they're called mo model zoos, are these sort of collections of models. So you can find a model that already exists, uh, and then you can do something called fine tuning. So fine tuning, you can imagine, is, you know, let's say you have image classification, you know, it can classify, you know, ResNet can do what, 10,000 different images. If you only care about five of those, what you do is you just feed it a whole bunch of new training examples of just the five that you care about, and the model just sort of gets better at classifying those five. So you, you rarely even need to start from scratch here. And that's something called transfer learning. 
uh, the, other, the other terminology for it is auto ML, right? So you start with an existing model and then you can fine tune it for your purpose. And uh, with Gluon, what's nice is uh, you can actually pull these models in. So you can basically say, hey, you know, I want to do image classification. Uh, I just, you know, there's a method called to download, you know, these, these uh, pre-trained models. And then typically what you do is you just detach one of the layers and then put your, your output layer on and then it, it fine tunes the weights with the, with the data you're using. Sorry? Yeah, there's a number of different formats uh, that, that these models can be um, stored in. Uh, I'm not sure what Gluon is using, but it has its own sort of repository. Yeah, and so you can see here, like, I'm grabbing ResNet 18 version 1, and I'm telling it it's pre-trained pre is true. And you can see I can just actually invoke that model right away uh, on my data, right? I don't need to actually define a new uh, architecture. And uh, once we have it, we can deploy it, right? Uh, so we have a number of different ways to do it. SageMaker, if, you're, you know, uh, if you're, you want to manage service, if you're doing IoT, you want to do inferences on a, on a device, uh, EC2, ECS for containers, mobile devices, or whatever you can dream up. All right. Uh, so this is just really how you, you, know, you would call a, a deployed model. And this, this is just some Java code. And we'll get into the, in the next part of the, the talk, which I want to get to, uh, we'll, we'll go into sort of uh, how you, you uh, optimize inferences. So, but in this case, we're just, we're just calling a, a, we're getting a prediction from a deployed model. All right. You can, yeah. So typically what you do is you put the model out on a, like a REST endpoint, and then you just have whatever language you want consume the predictions off the endpoint. Yep. These are just some of the industries that are using uh, deep learning. And uh, if you want to get started, the, you know, these URLs are, are great. Uh, I like the, the, the Gluon tutorials. You just uh, bring up a, a Python notebook and you're, you're good to go. All right. And we will hand it over to Samsung. <laughs> Thank you, Nate. Um, hi, I'm Sanjay Men. I work at Samsung SDS. Uh, Samsung SDS is one of the um, Samsung Group company, and I'm heading the um, data analytics center at Samsung SDS. We do um, deep learning R&D in three areas. One is the, um, um, the visual data. Depending on the data, we have three areas. One is the visual data, like uh, object recognition. You tell if it's a cat or a dog. Second one is a, a textual data, it's a, a natural language processing. The third area is a, a time series data. So in time series data, one of the example is a cardiac arrhythmia detection. So what I'm gonna talk about today, the deep learning techniques and um, methodologies I'm gonna present today, it can be applied to other uh, time series data analysis. For example, the um, speech recognition. Uh, we use it for the um, uh, smart home appliances. And second use case could be uh, anomaly detection. Uh, we have a lot of sensor data from manufacturing line and also the um, sales forecasting of using the marketing data. So I will talk about main, main use case would, I mean the um, example is a cardiac arrhythmia. So what is cardiac arrhythmia? It's a, um, group of conditions uh, in which the heartbeat is regular, too fast or too slow. And on the top left graph shows the, um, the, the electrical activity that is recorded using electrodes uh, placed on, on your skin. And this signal is called ECG, electrocardiography. Uh, and the top right graph is the schematic diagram of the normal heartbeat as seen on ECG. And the bottom one is the um, uh, monitoring screen uh, that we captured. So now, why we want to use apply deep learning in cardiac arrhythmia detection? The challenge is that over 300 million ECGs are recorded annually. And each ECG data, usually a 24-hour recording from one person, is more than 80,000 heartbeats, which is a large amount of data. And for doctors, like um, clinicians and cardiologists, they need to examine all these uh, heartbeats 
to tell if you, you have a, a arrhythmia or not, which is a very time consuming. And the fact is that if the heart has a arrhythmia condition, that only 2.5% of the heartbeats will show irregular pattern. And all other 97.5% will look normal. So what if AI and deep learning technique can pinpoint these uh, irregular patterns and mark them, then our doctors can only examine these parts, which will significantly reduce the time of clinicians and cardiologists. And it will also increase the accuracy of the uh, diagnosis because they can focus only those parts. So that's the motivation. Um, then why not use uh, traditional machine learning? Why we, are, we prefer deep learning uh, when we detect this cardio, I mean, cardiac uh, arrhythmia? The first reason is that there are 40 different types of arrhythmia. There are so many. And one of, um, two of them I'm showing here, uh, that each heartbeat that are marked by alphabet V is called ventricular tachycardia. It's when you have an abnormal electrical signal from the lower chambers of your heart. Uh, it gets faster than uh, that is marked as V. The bottom one is called atrial fibrillation, also known as AFib. You can tell that the interval between the heartbeats are different. So it, the intervals are irregular. We call this one AFib here. These two obvious ones, you can tell the difference. I mean, you can find what are the features that can differentiate these different types of arrhythmia. But there are so many. There are almost 40 of them. And it is very difficult to extract these features and how they are different. So if you are applying machine learning, you have to do it manually. You have to be a, have a very high level of expertise in extracting features from this kind of data. But if you are applying deep learning, deep learning will do that for you. It's called automatic feature extraction. So you just provide this data with labels, meaning data plus answers. Then um, the deep learning will do the automatically extracted uh, features, and you can use that. Second reason is this. Um, now I just talked about the irregular case. Even for the normal case, there are so many data. Uh, for example, here, the top graph is about inverted T, that usually the T graph, T wave, has a positive uh, amplitude, but this person has a, a negative amplitude, but for him, this is a normal heartbeat for him. Maybe this is caused by the um, hyperkalemia, uh, but this is his normal heartbeat every day. The bottom one is called large T case because the T wave is larger than R peak, but also this is his um, uh, normal heartbeat. Now, our task is we have to include the, even these weird cases as a normal case. So it means that there are so many input data we need to train. And um, what good, I mean, deep learning do, does better than machine learning is that it has a higher capacity. Usually, if you increase the input data size, the accuracy of the, your trained model will increase proportionally. But at certain point, no matter how you increase the data, it will reach a saturation point. Uh, the difference between Machine learning and deep learning is that deep learning will reach this saturation point way later than the machine learning. So you can train more data. So that's why uh, deep learning, in this case, with complex data set, deep learning will do uh, better than ma machine learning. Now I'm going to start talking about how we apply deep learning for, for detecting uh, arrhythmia. So the input is like this kind of time series data that with a back, uh, gray background. Uh, we apply this time window and we perform this uh, fast Fourier transform. Then it will translate the data, time domain data, into the uh, frequency domain data. And you slide this uh, window, time window, to the right, and then you will get this consecutive uh, frequency information. And if you append them all, you, you got the uh, middle figure, which is a two dimensional image. Now you can apply the convolutional neural network. Here, we train the convolutional neural network to uh, output, generate these features. So this is what we call automatic feature uh, generation. Uh, this doesn't look meaningful for a human eye, but this is the uh, most representative features that will tell the difference between uh, uh, these uh, arrhythmia patterns. 
Now we're going to use these features as an input to the RNN. Uh, as Nate described what RNN is, RNN is, is good at uh, recognizing the sequence data, time series data. So these features are 90 degree clockwise rotated. So the top one is the early one. The bottom one is the later one. So you f we feed that data, feed that input to the RNN. There are two networks. One is the forward network. The other is a backward network. The reason we have two networks is that uh, we want to have capture the relationship between previous uh, heartbeat to the next heartbeat. Also, next heartbeat to the previous heartbeat. So we need both directions. And we combine this information and use it as a, a input to the classifier. Then this classifier will generate which one of the uh, 40 different uh, arrhythmia patterns. So that's how, that's the architecture of our deep learning. Now, once train is done, you have to deploy in an actual system, um, the production level. There are many different types, but this is one which we tested. Um, so the patch is um, attached to near your uh, heart or uh, around your wrist, and it will record the ECG graph, and it will be stored on your mobile device. And mobile, your mobile device, depending on the setting, it can upload periodically to the cloud, or whenever it has a Wi-Fi access, it will upload to the cloud. And we will perform the inference, which is analyzing this 24-hour data, and then this result will be sent to the hospital. So this is the screen cap, uh, screenshot of our system that uh, every red heartbeats are the ones that we want the doctors to look uh, very carefully. And then the doctors can zoom in and zoom out uh, to see if, uh, uh, if there are real arrhythmia patterns or not. Use cases range from first responder monitoring, elderly care to sports performance tracking, um, now I'm going to talk about how we fine tune the, um, the inferencing. So when you uh, run it on P2, uh, then on so four, four C GPUs it took 20 minutes, one GPU 80 minutes, and when we run it on C5 it took like 120 minutes. Um, so the customers may want G just GPU or they want uh, CPU. So we wanted to reduce the CPU time, which is from 120 minutes to less than five minutes. So that was first, our first optimization goal. But we didn't want to sacrifice the accuracy, target accuracy. So the accuracy that we ob obtained at uh, this status, we want to keep that one. So that's, uh, that was our goal, optimization goal. And this is our journey to this inference and, uh, time optimization. So there are two lines. One is a blue one, and blue one is the latency. So it's starting from 120 minutes, and after eight steps of optimization, we reach to under three minutes. So lower the better, because it's a latency. Red one is the um, relative target accuracy. So it started from the, the right y-axis, 100%, and you apply the uh, optimization to reduce the latency. Sometimes the performance of accuracy degrades, but in the end, we, we went back to 100%. So I'm gonna just uh, talk a little bit, just one or two examples here. The first column, leftmost column, we have 16 CPUs, bidirectional GRU algorithm, 256 sampling rate. So in order to reduce the latency time, the second column, the yellow text says that we reduced the sampling from 256 to 128. So the data size is reduced to half. That's why we have a uh, inference time is reduced uh, by half. So then since the data is small, our accuracy dropped also. That's not what we want. So we do multiple optimization. We keep um, in reducing the latency time, but also later, like step seven, we apply some optimization to increase the accuracy. So that there we apply yellow text says auto data balancing, because usually you have a lot of normal case data, but small um, arrhythmia case. So when we do the each training every apple, we use the a, a similar size data. We randomly sample from the normal case so that 
that kind of optimization really help uh, this kind of performance improvement. So um, for your data and your use case will be different, but applying this, you will go through this kind of similar pattern to get the final result. So this is one example. And finally, um, this is a kind of ongoing uh, future work. Um, if you are a data scientist and with programming background, you can do uh, Python coding to run uh, uh, many frameworks. But if you are a domain expert and you just want to apply AI to, you, to your domain, then um, instead of doing any typing, you can just use the uh, visual programming model like this. This is called uh, Brightix that Samsung SDS is developing. Uh, that here, uh, the magenta color node, that, that's the input. You can uh, specify the which region, like east, US east or US west region of where you want to deploy your uh, Amazon uh, um, instances. And then once, once you select this one, you apply some deep learning model. And the SageMaker will return the result. And you can see the uh, output and see if you, if you need a further uh, tuning point here. So this is an interface to um, not only the Amazon SageMaker, we're also uh, planning to uh, connect to the um, MXNet uh, so that you can do the visual programming here. So I think that's the end. Um, back to you, Nate. Thank you. OK, uh, so uh, we have a, a few minutes left, so we can do a little bit of Q&A. Uh, real quick before that, though, please uh, take the survey, uh, which you can do through the mobile app. So we, we do use the, the survey data to uh, inform what we'll do for, for upcoming events like this. And uh, thanks so much for coming. And uh, if you have questions, I guess you know, we'll, we'll hang out for a little bit uh, over on the side here. And, uh, for those that want to go uh, find the pub crawl, I completely understand. <laughs> Thank you.